It's great to see so many friends here tonight, and also people whom I don't know. Uh, welcome. Um, this is the first reading in 40. I've been reading, giving public readings for 45 years, and this is the first time that I'll be reading prose and poetry. Um, I published three books this year. Um, on Beauty is the most recent one, mm -hmm. and um, then there's um, and On Beauty is a collection of essays, reviews, fiction, and plays. Most of the book was written in the last year, um, and it just kind of fell together. Um, it, it, under the auspices, um, I had some poems accepted in um, a journal called Peacock Journal, whose theme is beauty. And they asked for an artist statement, so I wrote an artist statement. And um, I thought, well, this is interesting because I think it's really more of an essay. I didn't give them two paragraphs. I gave them a little bit more than that. It was a short essay. The essay won an essay contest, and then I um, wrote some various other prose pieces last year, and um, the, before the book went to press, I again sent some work to Peacock Journal, and they accepted the work, and they wanted yet another artist statement. So I wrote another essay on beauty, uh, but that dealt with, uh, with, uh, the, with the topic of evanescence. So they bookend the first section of the book. It also became a vehicle for me to collect my few fiction pieces and my few plays. This is Singing for Nothing, and uh, this also came out this year. This is a, a, a big book, 366 pages. It collects 40 years of um, selected uh, nonfiction. Um, I wrote for the New Haven Advocate back in the 70s when people like Jonathan Haar, who wrote Civil Action, was on the staff, and Robert Palm, who ended up writing uh, Law and Order. These are good writers, uh, and they were my friends. Um, so uh, this, this collects um, a very select uh, uh, so, uh, amount of my nonfiction, uh, but it's, a, it's a, quite a tome. And I actually, as a poet, never thought I would put together a book that was 366 pages long. Um, and then this book is entitled The Map of Eternity, and this is a, a volume of poetry. Um, this was, the poems are, pretty much uh, from, uh, let's see, 2016, 2017. Um, I'll be reading from this. Um, and then the fourth book I'll be reading from tonight will be, um, will be selections from each of the books. So uh, you won't have to stay here all evening. Um, this is The View of the River, and this was published uh, in 2017. I also have to remark that um, uh, Betty Wilda, who probably does not want me to mention this because she's sitting right over to my left. Um, she has um, designed three of my covers, uh, this being one of them. And the reason why I wanted to read from this is because this image is taken um, from the Hadley Dyke over here. Um, and Betty took that photograph. And also Betty took this uh, photograph of, um, I call it the studio. This is my apartment, but I refer to it as the studio. and. Um, I have to thank her for all the wonderful work she's done. Um, I'm going to begin tonight by, by reading the essay uh, on beauty, which I, um, uh, which I wrote um, in October of uh, 2017. And I, um, I, I speak, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a cinema buff to a certain degree. Um, I speak about a, about, a, uh, about a Michael Haneke film. And, uh, when I was in New Haven years ago, I was a member of three, or I guess it was five Yale film societies. So film is always and has and remains a large part of my um, aesthetic life. On um, beauty. Beauty is relative. However, it is also abundant and perennial. One type of beauty may diminish and morph into a deeper philosophical truth. Beauty can take the guise of morality and define the outer reaches of what it means to be fully human to grow into that. The film Amour, directed by Michael Haneke, which was made in 2012 and won the Palme d'Or, is ostensibly all about beauty and what is beautiful about life, as well as what, what are intrinsic elements of living that may seem as being opposite to beauty. The film's characters are a husband and a wife, two former music teachers in their twilight weeks and days, 
Jean-Louis Trintonant is Georges, and Emmanuel Riva is Anne. They are retired, they are cultured, they read, go to concerts, enjoy each other's conversation, and still love each other, for the most part. Anne once shocks Georges by saying his wives often enough stun their husbands by their appraisals of their characters. You're a monster sometimes, she says. However, she clarifies that declarative sentence by adding, but very kind. That is beautiful. After a lifetime of marriage to each other, Anne suffers two strokes, and Georges cares for her throughout her decline. He bathes her, feeds her, exercises the leg on the side she can no longer feel, practices speech therapy with her. Many men, or wives for that matter, would, would never have the wherewithal or the courage to brave such lengths of true amour. Georges may be guilty of being a monster in Anne's experience, but he is the precipitant in furthering the spark of beauty between them. The drama may seem very French, something Camus or Sartre would have taken delight in, with both Georges and Anne seeing the end of their lives in plain sight. However, instead of being grim, they rise above the end of life in common transcendence, in their amour, and its tacit veracity. There are several touching scenes regarding Georges' physical care for Anne, which are truly heart-rendering in their depth of humanity and active loving. The viewer is offered the essence of what love is and what having an affair is not. Hence, this is the irony apparent in the film's title. In today's world, where greed, sex, and narcissism are common, the beauty of Georges and Anne is exemplary, is not only a moral and cultural pedagogy without pedantry, but quite aesthetically and humanely, one act of beauty after another. Through another, another's lens, this might be seen as hardship and turmoil, unimaginable spousal duty and death in life. At the, at the film's end, without giving anything away, George is clipping the flower heads from a bunch of daisies he has just purchased at the florist. He fills the kitchen sink and scissors the flowers into the water, then throws, throws away the stems. These are meant for his Anne. Often we need to practice the art of discernment in order to see clearly. Sometimes we need to ruin the flowered stalk to create the, a ritual for celebration. As Anne says in one scene over dinner with Georges, while well, looking through a photograph, looking through photograph albums, it's beautiful, Georges responds. What, Anne's, Anne answers, life, so long. That is what constitutes perennial beauty, and remains beautiful. If we allow ourselves to discover the epiphany and the commonplace in our lives, we realize to our astonishment that all along, through every disappointment and affliction, we can say, it's beautiful. I, um, last spring, I was in contact with the editor of a, a new magazine, a new journal called Rosa, which uh, the subtitle to the journal is Women in Politics and Power. And um, I had a terrific con telephone conversation with the editor who, um, in, the, in the course of the conversation, I mentioned that something about how it would be wonderful if there was still an art, an art of give and take in politics. And of course there isn't. And she said, well, why don't you write an article about that? So I'll be reading um, a piece um, or sections, um, two or three sections from, um, from a piece that I uh, wrote called The Art of Give and Take. And this section, I, um, again, this is after a film. And um, I had seen a film regarding the life of Hannah Arendt. And it's just a spectacular film if you get a chance to see it. And uh, I started thinking about Hannah Arendt's theory of the, of the banality of evil uh, in response to today's political climate. And uh, this section of the, of the essay is called The Lack of Discernment and Hannah Arendt's Banality of Evil. In, in interpreting the trial of Holocaust engineer Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem in 1960, Van Trata has also created films regarding other women who made a difference and who altered the course of history, such as in her films honoring the political revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg, 
1986, and Vision, 2009, regarding the 12th century Christian nun and mystic, mystic Hildegard von Bingen. And that film truly is something everybody should go out and see. That's Vision. In Hannah Arendt, von Trotta again works seamlessly with her star, Barbara Sakawa, who adroitly plays the heroine in each film. What is significant here are several points. The first being that we can be informed from intelligent cinema. The second being that we can be altered by such use of cinema as art form. And lastly, that women can create a cinema of significance without bludgeoning, bludgeoning us with sloganistic feminism or waving a placard proclaiming victimhood, but offer instead an aptly rendered aesthetic expression and philosophical truth, which not only predicates grace, but takes sweat to accomplish. In Von Trotta's direction in cinematography and Sakawa's rather engaged acting, there is an art of give and take. We are clearly presented with heroines whom we easily admire, who can augment our lives, whether we are women or men. And this is achieved not through an ardent feminism, but in a brand of progressive vision, which could be called humanism, which was a major contributing factor to precipitating the flourishing of the Renaissance. Why Arendt is so important to consider is that she stressed that an inability to think led to a lack of discernment, which then eventuated a moral collapse. If we consider Arendt's heroic five-part article in The New Yorker in 1962, which was later, later published as a book entitled Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, uh, New York Viking, 1963, there is a sim similar lack of discernment today regarding Eichmann's but banality of even, uh, evil rather, in relationship to Trump and Trumpism, especially in regard of his abandonment of prudence and reason. The point made here is that lack of discernment or not being able to think then presupposes a collapse of moral order, upon which any notion of the art and give and take dis disintegrates, disintegrates. Since the art of intelligent dialogue is lost and only diatribe and a rhetoric of incoherence is accepted based only on its braggadocio, as is, as is evidenced in the current administration and its supporters. This next section is called The Lonely Business of Thinking and Sheer Thoughtlessness. If the art of give and take is dependent on discernment, discernment is then dependent upon thinking itself. That tautology is made quite evident in a quote of Hannah Arendt from Eichmann in Jerusalem, which reads, evil is supposed to be something demonic. However, as Arendt then concludes the five-part New Yorker series, later turned into book form, its quote-unquote incarnation is Satan. But in the case of Eichmann, I could find no such trace of satanic greatness. Eichmann was not, was not a monster, not even particularly anti-Semitic. He was simply unable to think. Sheer thoughtlessness, not to be confused with stupidity, predisposed him to become one of the greatest criminals of the 20th century. Utter lack of discernment is proof enough in a philosophy peculiar to Arendt's incisive logic to, po to posit that thoughtlessness is the origin of the extin extinction of the, art of the art of give and take. Simply put, if we are in doubt of the facts of global warming, we face extinction as a, as a species. And since we are losing the art of give and take, we unwittingly face extinction. Thinking is a lonely business, the philosopher Ma modern Martin Heidegger is portrayed as saying in the film. I don't want to judge, only to understand, says Arendt. Gary Paris, writing in a review of the film in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette in, uh, in July 26, 2013, suggests that through Arendt we are endowed by her thinking with the power to act. The review continues importantly. Director Margareta von Trotta has previously produced biopics of such powerful women subjects as the mystic nun Hildegard von Bingen and the leftist revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg. Her no frills screenplay at hand is similarly uncompromising in its intellectual and historical demands on the audience, compounded by the complexities of German high philosophical thought. However, such complexities are not beyond understanding or thought itself. Okay. Essentially, Arendt's resulting theory of the banality of evil, Paris says, holds that the worst evil come from not thinking, from not thinking for oneself, or as Arendt expresses, 
as the huge difference between the unspeakable horror of the deeds and the mediocrity of the man. Hannah Arendt described Eichmann as a nobody, a high school dropout, a cog in the wheel, a mindless bureaucrat. Eichmann was only following orders. He feels no guilt. He is proud of his, he is proud of his obedience, not to mention his efficiency. He just obeyed the law. If instead of thou shalt not kill, the law said thou shalt kill, it wasn't his fault. I never exterminated anyone, he says, not personally, and he believes it. Mediocr mediocr mediocrity is not ascribed here to most of us who don't have a PhD. Mediocrity is a characteristic to rise above, to clear, for each of us in our own pursuit of the discipline of thinking, which always then leads to discernment, to choosing, to making a choice, to making a choice. Everett Dirksen chose to speak well and to enable civil rights, despite the fact that he also chose to support the Vietnam War. We can make a choice in learning about the, uh, climate change and what we can do about it, since it is our civic and humane responsibilities to do so. We can practice the art of give and take. We can choose eloquence over empty rhetoric, complete sentences over hackneyed speech, a reasoned and balanced approach in reaching across to those who disagree with us. However, we must also resist those who do not practice the art of give and take, who act thoughtlessly, who do not ex exhibit discernment, since it is also our duty and responsibility to do so. As with the case of Adolf Eichmann, he had a choice to stop killing the millions of innocents in the Holocaust, but he wasn't able to make that discernment and continued to act on command without thinking. It is similar to Trump and Trumpism, with its notorious brand and whose egocentric signature looms large with the lack of forethought and discernment. We can practice the art of give and take for only so long before our own thinking and discernment leads us to our resistance of what is abhorrent and unsavory, since America's present and future are at stake without our proactive engagement in our enabling ourselves in the power to act judiciously with courage and merit in standing for the truth instead of thoughtlessness and in irresponsibility. I thought I might try some more prose and I'll try to spare you, then move on to some poetry. Um, I thought I would read um, the last section of my preface to Singing for Nothing, <clears throat> I, uh, I put a, a lot of effort in the preface so I could open the book, um, which uh, uh, the preface truly um, really tries to relate what the book is about. And when I dropped off a copy to my friend Richard Shaw at his office door, um, uh, he then emailed me a couple of days later and he said, I really like that preface. So I thought I would uh, try to do this justice. Um, in the preface, or in this section of the preface, I honor an individual who is still very dear to me, a, a woman named Mrs. R. Uh, she uh, was known to Mrs. R because her name was Alberta Robertson. And she was the manager of Johnson's secondhand bookshop. And you never called her Alberta. Uh, she was known as Mrs. R. And uh, she and I became friends. And uh, it was quite a, a wonderful friendship. She had. Uh, uh, she had been a librarian at Springfield uh, Library for about 25 years, retired and then went over to Johnson's for another 25 years and was a manager there and uh, I, I followed uh, in, her, in her steps. So I begin um, the last, couple, last few paragraphs of my preface of this book. In a life having worked with books or perhaps ev on every conceivable level, from sewing copies of Signatures, signatures of fine letterpress books by hand, to boxing up children's books for a book fair, to writing lead paragraphs for an old friend for a separate book reviews on the floor of her living room on a Sunday afternoon in New Haven amid pages of the Sunday New York Times. Books have not, just, have not been just a meager part of my life, but they have also indeed made up the entirety of my life. By making the selections I have for this book, I am sharing with you the best of my life with books. I had occasion to work with an absolutely fascinating woman named Mrs. R. Mrs. R's name was actually Mrs. Alberta Robertson. 
No one dared call her Alberta. So she was known as Mrs. R. She had a 20-year career at Springfield Library in Springfield, Massachusetts. In the late 1960s, she began her second career as manager and lead book buyer at Johnson's Secondhand Bookshop, once an anchor store on Main Street in Springfield for more than a century. After Mrs. R. retired, I was hired as manager in the mid-1980s. In my time working at Johnson's, I made some changes which Mrs. R. didn't agree with, such as shelving the books with the title spine vertically whereas she used to shelve them horizontally so you could read them more easily. However, there were also some things I made sure to honor just as they were. One of the things I left the same was the books on books table where a reader would find just that, informative and delightful books regarding books themselves in multitudinous ways. I would often display fine press material, bibliographies and literary criticism there after I returned from a book auction. Although not quite fitting any of the rubrics above, I believe the book I have written here might be best displayed on the books on books table of Mrs. R's, or at least I hope so. And if a bookseller should shelve this book in a literary subsection in the sociology aisle, that in itself would make my writing this book worthwhile, especially considering the study I enclose herein regarding the history of retirement in America. Actually, Pardon me, my intent in this essay, by making use of historical references, although based on nonpartisan research, is to inflect a, a stance that is progressive in the best of socio-political contexts. Actually, I dream of the day a new and relevant WA program might be instituted. America could benefit immensely by the utility of such a program, one that is intelligent, intelligently administered as was FDR's during the Great Depression. Mrs. R. always enough repeated the phrase, the road to hell is paved with the best, in, uh, best intentions. This selected nonfiction as literary memoir is one of my best intentions. It is, as I have offered, nonfiction written by a writer who is primarily at least thought of as first being a poet. You, if you should read this book and find yourself infused with the resonance that I am a nonfiction writer worth reading and a writer whose nonfiction will get you to the train on time, to sometimes experience the essence of poetry, which is the rush of the train itself, then I would be not only delighted, but also grateful that you decided to take a ride that was possibly worth going on. Uh, I'll be reading four poems from two books, and. Then I'll be closing the program, but I'll be opening the floor to a Q&A, so if anybody has any questions, I'd love to, to field them. Uh, this is a poem, be reading, um, be reading four short poems from the view of the river, which actually contains, um, a, most of the book are, uh, contains long poems, two and three page poems, but I'll be reading shorter pieces from the book. This is entitled um, the, the Streaming, and um, I was driving on Bay Road a couple, maybe three years ago, um, going toward a, uh, going toward a Atkins, um, and uh, on the right, going towards Atkins, there's uh, there's a small um, there's a small orchard, and the sun was cresting over the range, the Holyoke Range, and, and it inspired this poem, the stream. Rain like late November. The pippins remaining on branches in the orchard, in the shadow of the mountain, glowing, nearly translucent, each lozenge, each lozenge, each lozenge, a struck tone when the long beams of early morning emerge above the slopes of the tree line of conifer that then distinguishes such evanescence, another becoming, the melting frost, every droplet of dew, always this gift of the lucid memory of someone's hand dear to you, once touching yours. Uh, about four or five years ago, a friend of mine who was just sitting in the audience gave me for Christmas a book by Elliot Weinberger called um, 19 Ways of Looking at Wang Wei. And the book basically is um, Wang Wei is a Chinese poet, ancient Chinese poet, and um, this specific poem, Dear Park, has been translated by a number of people. Um, Elliot Weinberger, 
suggesting that, uh, or exhibiting that uh, 19 uh, rather well-known poets tried to, to uh, translate this poem, and it's so nuanced that uh, they had all uh, had different versions. So after reading the book, I realized that I had my own. So this is entitled Deer Park. It just appeared in the journal Appalachia, this, this June issue. Deer Park after Wang Wei. Solitary, on the mountain, deep in the forest, no one for miles. Although the voices from the valley rise up in the distance. Returning, the cast shadows, late sun, breaks through the pine branches. Reappearing again, the light illumines the moss, as green as jade reflections. This next poem is entitled Fox, and um, for over 20 years I've been working with a terrific editor and human being, Parkman Howe, who is the poetry editor at Appalachia. And um, I, I've spoken to other people who have submitted work to Appalachia, and they say, well, do you get one of these two-page letters from Parkman uh, with suggestions to regarding one poem? And I say, yes, but I work through them, and they say that they don't. So. I published there for over 20 years, and I've learned a lot from Parkman Howe. Um, however, he claims that my talismanic or my um, my talismanic animal is, is the fox, and he also claims that uh, I use that the fox itself is a metaphor for my own poetry. Um, this is entitled Fox, and this also appeared in Appalachia. She travels the border on this side of the windbreak of farm and open meadow, and between the time I look out the front window, place my bowl of soup on the table, lift my head again, moves, releases herself to the wind, springs on black furred feet so quick, so deliberate in the rhythm of graceful bounds, her light red coat stretched full length, the white bib of her chest barely visible in its invisibility. I am left breathless by the four leaps that take her to an opening among clumps of leafless honeysuckle where she slips into dusk, turning silver as she springs, rapturous, into mind, into body, this everlasting moment passing as it passes into the miraculous. And I'm going to read a love poem. Taking residence, not wanting it to sing too loudly or for it to fly away. It's learning what it is that is taking residence in the heart. Not desiring to hold on to it, not wanting for it to dissipate, is how the presence in the heart requests to be honored. The visitor making itself known by the murmurs, by the murmurs of its rustling. It is what propels the fountain of it in keeping its arcing waters from ebbing, only if by resisting what the heart yearns for, even slightly, which is why the heart leaps amid all of its windy fluttering. Your loveliness is as sinuous as the colloquy of birdsong on a summer morning. I'm going to end with four poems from my new book, The Map of Eternity. Um, it was published by Shanti Arts in Brunswick, Maine. It's the second book that Shanti Arts has published of mine. And uh, uh, I don't know if it's going to be next year or not, but uh, there are also, Shanti Arts will be doing a, um, a new, a selected new poems of mine called Evanescence. It'll collect uh, 15, it'll uh, embrace 15 collections uh, or selections from books of mine and uh, paginate at uh, just under 400 pages. So it will be a watershed book for me. It'll be my poetic opus. Um, if you haven't noticed by the first four poems, I am primarily a nature writer and I do address local um, uh, areas. So this is entitled Ode to the Holy Oak Range. From the expanse of farm meadows on Moody Bridge Lane that still hasn't been ruined by more thoughtless development, a complete vista can be seen in its particular splendor. 
This series of hills could be an installation sculpture of a landlocked school of cresting baby belugas rising across the sky from right to left and from west to east. These 200 million year old basalt mountains worn by weather and time, snow and ice glazing their cliff faces well into early spring, annually revivify themselves. As the Japanese haiku poet Tadashi Kondo once said to me, they are most beautiful now with the lime green blossoms of budding trees infusing the contours of the ridges, making them at least as beautiful as the crimson and yellow colors of autumn. The five distinct peaks, Mount Holyoke, Mount, Hitch Mount Hitch Hitchcock, Bear Mountain, Norwatic, and Long Mountain, whose views include the diminutive Fork River Valley ecosystem, and whose irregular plateau looks down on its rocky upper slopes that blaze in the sun, whose lower, whose lower ravines remain cool and moist, folded into the shade of its cliffs, defines where I have lived for most of my life, has me measuring the length of each day by observing the seasonal changes of weather that pass over its slopes, impacting my very existence, inculcating a humility and gratitude of living, in cultivating an appreciation of what is warm, what is known as wabi in Japanese, and what is both timeless and finite in its distinct and boundless hard scrabble iterations. The next poem I'm reading is um, a favorite of my friend Richard Shaw's, so I'm going to do this <laughs> honor. It's entitled Ranta. October turns to November, and the golden light silvers. They announce themselves as they appear over the rim of the far meadow, rearrange their wedge in mid-flight to hear once more their voices, the wild music of their cries, their name, Branta, a dialect native only to their own. They fly ragged in the wind, reform across the sky, then pause between looking and listening before they disappear in air. I saw them stroking through just now, a quietude settling until another flock passes. Their lamentation lingers each day as they pass, and the season augurs toward winter. I wrote this poem this past January, actually, after having a, I, I woke one morning thinking of James Wright's poem, In Fear of Harvests, and um, for the last several years, I, um, I, have some, I have several spiritual practices, one of them which is presence, and another one is uh, listening to guidance, which is a little bit more than just listening to one, one's inner voice or one's intuition. And uh, it was published in the Galway Review. Poem after James Wright's In Fear of Harvests. It still happens now, James, as ever, somewhere, close by, nearly motionless, a solitary chorus phrases, breath steaming from its nostrils as it snorts happiness. And yes, the bees, those ardent little sisters work the crops in the fields and ply their small bodies into wreaths of blossoms, whose nectar thickens into wild honey beneath the buzz of silence, as your words do, in an apiary submerged beneath hives of snow. I've had several pushcart, I'm going to end with this poem, I have had several pushcart nominations over the years, and this is a poem uh, entitled The Rain in October, and this was a pushcart nomination. Uh, a friend of mine, Mark Burroughs, who um, teaches in Germany, and uh, who edits um, several magazines, um, invited me to submit some work. Uh, and he published this poem, The Rain in October. The poem regards presence. The rain all night, lifting by morning, suffusing the gray light with silver, and tinting my recollections of other years, wanting to pry behind what it is that was relevant then as it is pertinent now, 
the calling within all of that, the rain beginning again lightly, the glistening in that and what is just beneath that, which is what causes me to pause, looking out at the meadow of Queen Anne's lace, browning to umber, becoming itself its own sepia photograph, and my walking back in the misting rain, marveling at just this, this moment of this day, this rolling of drops of rain across leaves of honeysuckle in the windbreak, the bittersweet's beaded yellow berries, the gilded ochre inflorescence of goldenrod, the vibrancy even in the waving, the waning rather, of that moment becoming another, rising mist dissolving over the pasture across the road, the acrid odor of wood smoke, the astonishment in a candelabra of rain glittering in the pink hydrangeas late bloom. Thank you. Any questions? I'd love to take questions. Joyce? No. <laughs> I keep on you. Anyone? Anne? No, thank no. you. <laughs> Susan, you usually have questions. I do, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I just was curious about your the way you read the selections tonight with the prose first and the poetry last and that kind of thing. And what kind of thinking went into that oh, a when lot. you were assembling? That's, that's a very good question, poetry. actually. A lot of thinking went into it because um, there's a lot of work that three books, and then I wanted to also represent The View of the River. Um, a lot of thought went into what I could read and what I wanted to read, and then what would fit. And um, it all coalesced oh, only in the last couple of days, although I started reading after I had spoken, not reading, uh, planning of uh, what I might read after speaking with Patrick back in, I think, early October. Um, so a lot of it, um, I, I had, I made changes, actually, in what I thought I might read. Um, I know I, I wanted to read on beauty. Um, yeah. I wanted to read the Hannah Arendt piece because it was close to me. And also, those pieces were written um, in the last year. So it was actually harder for me to choose work from Singing for Nothing, which is, um, I think, the most recent material there is at least two years old. And um, I once um, had the great honor of, uh, of introducing Billy Collins, who I hosted at Trinity College in Hartford. And after I uh, introduced Billy, he got up to the podium and he said that uh, it's interesting about writers. We, we, like to, uh, we don't like to read what's older, but we like to read what we've just written or what's, 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 what's recent. So I lean towards what, what's recent, which is on things and on beauty, although I think that Singing for Nothing is a much better book. So there's the irony there. And um, although, again, I had longer poems in The View of the River, there were um, a couple of pieces, such as The Wang Wei and uh, Taking Residence, that I really wanted to read. So I chose And the Fox, which is all, I've, uh, I've entered a, a kind of new mystical way of living, I think. And The Fox represented that, um, as well as the, as the streaming. And then I also chose, um, wanted to chose, choose pieces that were relevant to the area since um, reading here at the Goodwin, and I thought that the Ode to the Holyoke Range piece was certainly one I, I wanted to represent. And then um, I like reading the last poem, Rain, The Rain in October, and I thought the James Wright piece um, was one that was, um, I wanted to read because I love Wright's work so much. And then I, the other piece I read from, um, the Map of Eternity, uh, which is Branta, which is, I think, uh, maybe a, a kind of um, a reading piece for me and other readings that I, I can I can highlight. So it was a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of consideration and discernment as to what I was going to represent. It was tonight. very interesting. It was interesting as it progressed. And I would like to say that I'm really happy that there are now 20 ways of translating Chinese <laughs> 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 literature. <laughs> well, it wouldn't have happened, Susan, if you didn't give me that book for right. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be looking for something else. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Thank Michael? You. Thank you. It was beautiful the way you laid the structure. And then from the structure you, you evolved almost, it was almost a haiku Japanese painting, the way you finished your reading. Yeah. Oh, well, you're very kind. Thank you for I that. I like that observation, yeah. Thank you. Steve? You're usually very perceptive. You're always perceptive. 
Since you're so in tune with the uh, with the area here and inspiration, are you inspired also by old, like silent film at all? Oh, I I do like silent film. I um, haven't watched it for some time. When I was in New Haven, I certainly saw a lot. Of, I saw silent film. Um, why do you, I'm just curious. Why do well, you it's ask? because of the love of nature and. Um, and the development that's going on everywhere. I was just wondering if you look back to the past of films that you mentioned. Well, I, I think it's very interesting. I'm, I'm, act, I'm actually reading a book now by, uh, it's a new book that's available through uh, the Western Massachusetts Library System by, um, I think the man's name is Pablo de Ors, O apostrophe. Um, um, I can't even think of how it's pronounced, but it's Pablo de Ors, I think. It's called, uh, it's called Silence. And he speaks about meditation. He's a he's a, a Spanish priest, and it's a really deep book, but a very accessible small book in hardcover, only about a hundred pages, uh, regarding silence. And uh, I I've begun to read it and to uh, to consider it. Um, yeah, I, well, all of the all of the building in the area certainly is is is, is a is a consternation, isn't it? For those of us like yourself, you were born here. Mm -hmm. I, I came to the valley in '81, and um, I find it abhorrent to a large degree. So, uh, is that that's what you were addressing? Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I because the, the films from obviously years ago were simpler, and by not having sound, for instance. Um, I was wondering if it was inspiration in the, in the old films where you could interpret something a different way. Right. Well, since you and I made a film together, did that film ever, that, that film, did that, that uh, ever I, It's still on the burner. It's a slow burner. Steve and, I, Steve and I and Betty made a film about a rabbit. Yes. <laughs> we, we, had a, we had a pet rabbit of. of Eastern and I, I started as a physician. Well, good way to move it along. Call him out in public. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Sometimes I'm graceless for sure. But it's not finished, of course. I, I, it, it's edited about 99 <laughs> film. Parts that are silent. Partially, partially silent. Right? Partially. Yeah. But the, it's a good film. The most important part is to get a, a voice for the rabbit, which it, it needs to be the right voice. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that. Later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all. I appreciate your attending, and it's been a real joy for uh, me to read to you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.